Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you for joining us for the Connecting with the Latinx Consumer During the Pandemic Tertulia. Tertulia is a word in Spanish that means an informal meeting of people to talk about current affairs, and in this case, the current Latinx consumer. I'm Antonio Tijerino, representing the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. We are thrilled to take part in today's presentation with our partners at HCODE and our friends at the Hispanic Public Relations Association under the leadership and the pride of the Dominican Republic, Andy Checo. With COVID pandemic entering its 10th month, as well as the 10th month since I've been wearing sweatpants, the recent record-breaking online sales on Cyber Monday, the timing could not be any better to take the pulse of the Latinx consumer as we enter the holiday season, which is gonna be unlike any in history. We wanted to see how we're doing as a community, what our plans are, how our behaviors have changed in recent months, and as we and the black and native communities have been disproportionately affected by this insidious pandemic, how are we reacting to it as consumers? The Connecting with the Latinx Consumer during the pandemic report, which HCODE and partners like us put out today, will shed light on some of the behaviors and challenges that our community has faced and on how our behaviors as consumers have shifted throughout the last 10 months of COVID-19. We have all had to adapt and change during this pandemic, and that includes the Latinx consumer. This presentation is an important opportunity to better gauge the mindset of the Latinx consumer and provide valuable data for the brands that are willing to get even more nuanced and adaptable in reaching our influential community. Our partnership with HCODE allows us as an organization to understand and support our community better. And we are also thrilled to work with HPRA USA as someone who cut his teeth in public relations and marketing at the beginning of my career. I've known the team at HCODE since the company started five years ago through my friendship with the pride of Calexico, Jonathan Patton, and my good friend, Mei Lin. And since then, they have enhanced our capabilities as an organization to serve the needs of our community in education, the workforce, and social justice through innovation and leadership. HCODE has simply made us better and more effective and more measurable because we work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. We wanna be able to demonstrate that value. HCODE has provided us not only with greater reach as they provide access to 30 million Hispanics digitally a month, but also to provide key insights to better serve our community, such as the ones from the report that we're releasing today. It's critical we collectively have access to insightful data and the narrative between the data, which will not only help Hispanic serving institutions like us, but also help brands like most of you tuning in to better understand the mindset of the Latinx consumer. As brands continue to adapt to the nuances of the Latinx consumer, it's critical to have the right information to make more informed, nuanced, and strategic decisions with a greater impact in this changing environment. And by the way, I encourage you to use the chat feature just to make sure it's on everyone and not just panelists, which is often the default. So just make sure that when you have an opportunity to chat with us, that it's on, on, pan, on um, beyond the panelists and for everyone. We wanna hear your comments, your questions, your insights as well during this tertulia. And by the way, there's almost 300 of you registered. So we welcome all your energy. Also, please know that this is being recorded and shared with a broader audience, including anyone of you that wanna send the link to others. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to today's tertulia participants from HCODE. Let me start with Francisco Gonzalez Cos, who is the Intelligence Center lead at HCODE and will kick us off by walking us through key insights. At HCODE, Francisco is responsible for building the data first approach strongly rooted throughout the company. He's a native of Mexico City, que viva Mexico. He has spent years studying the identity contributions and habits of Latin Americans after time in both the public and private sectors. And he's a passionate soccer fan and is an, 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 an eternal search for the best taco and mezcal in Los Angeles. And I'm in DC where Francisco used to live when he went to college here. And trust me, you're better proximity to tacos and mezcal in LA. Uh, next is my friend, uh, Melin De Leon, uh, the pride of Panama, who is the director of brand development at HCODE, where she has specialized in the US Latinx market for her entire career and brings over 10 years of experience tapping into cultural expertise, audience data and insights and leveraging innovative mediums of communication to help brands and agencies effectively connect with the Latinx consumer. 
And lastly, Matt Weisbecker, who is the CRO at HCODE, where he leads business development, leveraging 25 years of experience with AOL, and that's OG stuff right there, NBC, Amazon, and most recently, Epsilon Publicis, where he focused on identity and data. Uh, and native of New York, Matt is also an avid Lego enthusiast and scuba diver, and now lives in Los Angeles, where he raises three children. HCO team, welcome. Francisco will start us off. So with that, Francisco. Thanks, Antonio. Excited to be here, and thank you to HHF and HPRA for partnering with us today. What I'm going to share is really a sample of the data and insights we've been collecting throughout COVID. But I think it gives a good picture of the importance of this audience for brands and their agency partners. And of course, we'd be happy to dive deeper with anyone who is interested. I'm going to start with a quick overview of the study. The report that we are presenting today was backed by two different nationwide age code intelligence center studies. The COVID Digital Lives, which a study which ran over three periods in 2020, March, June, and October and was conducted among a pool of non-Latinx respondents, as well as English dominant and Spanish dominant Latinos. The 2020 Brands and Latino Marketing Study was conducted solely among Latinx respondents. All age code intelligence center surveys are completed by a proprietary opt-in Latinx panel, which is representative of all main geographical areas of the United States. On the next slide, we will delve into the main findings of the report. Our first finding states that Latinos are less likely than the general population of saying that keeping themselves and their loved ones safe and healthy during the pandemic is most important right now. And instead we see increases of importance in other areas. For example, in the next slide, we can see that Latinos are much more likely to select that getting enough food and supplies or finding a way to make a living is most important when we compare them to the general population. Similarly to other multicultural communities, Latinos have been disproportionately impacted to a higher degree than the general population by the pandemic. They're suffering a higher risk of food and job insecurity than others. In the next slide, we see that Latinos are more likely than the general population of stressing on recent threats to their livelihood, be it in the form of healthcare or finances, and instead on personal relationships at home. If we look at the next slide, we can see exactly how these things pan out. We know that the Latinx community has been impacted severely by the financial effects of the pandemic, while also being more in threat of being hospitalized by COVID than any other, which are highlighted in the three first stats where we see they over index over the general population. 45% are saying that they stress about the financial situation, while only 39% of the general population does so, 50% about their health, and 49% about work and related um, anxieties and responsibilities. However, if we look at this last stat, 51% are saying that personal relationships at home and developments are a uh, reason to be stressed. If we compare that to the general population, which is higher, it just shows that the relationships at home for Latinos are traditionally the really close knit and therefore they are not really stressing too much about it in comparison. Similarly, if we continue, Latinos continue to over index on digital use. We know this as a traditional feature of the Latino uh, community in the US. Their online shopping habits have actually surged throughout the pandemic. Being less willing to leave their homes, Hispanics are taking full advantage of the online marketplace and are much more likely to shop online than the general population. In the beginning of the pandemic, Online shopping habits centered mostly around groceries, cleaning supplies, and bathroom supplies. I think we all lived through this. While those remain quite important, buying electronics and clothing online has increased significantly in the last few months, suggesting a shift from the necessities that we needed at first to more of leisure um, products. In this next slide, I'll show you a, a chart of the three different columns of how we undertook the study. First, we, we analyzed in March how people were consuming and buying um, products. Then we compared it to June and, and finally in October. As mentioned, since the beginning of the pandemic, Hispanics were shifting their shopping habits from initial surges in cleaning supplies, bathroom supplies, towards more about clothing, workout, and electronics. Furthermore, given initial shortages and having to be smarter on expenses in the, in the next slide, sorry, thank you. 
Given initial shortages and having to be smarter on expenses, Latinos are now much more willing to be throwing loyalty out the window. Latinos aren't as brand loyal as they were. Um, they're much more likely to try new products during this time as they have to find cheap alternatives or just find whatever they can. We knew the shortages, we couldn't find our preferred um, toilet paper brand or our preferred cleaning supply and so on and so forth. Continuing, Latinos have been, are less likely to be traveling and celebrating with the families, with a larger family this holiday season, meaning they are relying much more on gifts that can be sent and can be accessible from indoors. This is the huge surges that we're gonna be seeing in gift cards and electronics, mostly things that they can use and enjoy in the indoors. A silver lining of the pandemic, in the, in the next slide, the, a silver lining of the pandemic has been that Latinos have been trying new brands and products that they might have not considered uh, beforehand. And one in four has found that they actually prefer these brands and will not shift back to their previous preferences. In other words, brand loyalty is not as important as it used to be. For brands and marketers out there, this is really important and something that they have to take note of. Um, in the next slide, we can look at the holiday shopping plans for Latin consumers. Having Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals happening in these last few days, and which actually many brands have been extending to week or month long offers, these insights are extremely timely, especially with Christmas right around the corner. For this holiday season, 65% of Latinos plan on celebrating the holidays virtually, as opposed to 58% of the general population. 59% will change the type of gifts they get this year to ensure people can use them. And this was the note that I was making about gift cards and electronics. 52% plan on spending somewhere between $100 and $400 total in gifts this year, while the general population is actually spending a little bit more than that. Additionally, this year has been very different for parents as children are now learning from home and will be needing new tools. And so gifts will be focusing on um, tablets, leapfrogs, laptops, these types of products, which will be much more easier for parents and for children to be learning from home. They will also be reducing their spending this year to reduce the economic constraints of the pandemic, while also only buying gifts for the closest of their relatives. Moving on, going forward, Latinos are much more likely to stock up their food supply than the rest of the population. They don't wanna to have to, um, face the same uncertainty that we did at the start of March and wanna make sure they're always prepared for it. On the next slide, and I think this is one of the insights and stats that if you have to take something out, out from this presentation is this. Almost every Latino out there agrees that when brands speak to them in the right way, they actually listen. It is of vital importance for brands to adapt their messaging to the target audience. 88% of Latinos prefer when brands tailor their messages to them. And finally, our research has found that for most Latinos, brands already make pretty good assumptions about the community. They recognize that we are highly family oriented, that we value our culture and that the role of women and families is important. But they also make some pretty bad assumptions every now and then that it's vital that they avoid, such as assume that we all speak Spanish, we don't, we're all from Mexico and that we are not tech savvy. These are the key insights from our study, and I'll throw it back to Antonio and our panelists for more of a discussion. Thank you. Francisco, thank you very much. Um, let me add Matt and, and May Lin to the mix. So um, actually, but I'll start with uh, May and Francisco. I'm curious as to where this data comes from. How was it sourced? That's a great question, Antonio. First, and before jumping into that, I just want to say that I'm very grateful to be here with everyone today, excited to be talking about this important topic um, that impacts our community and the opportunities that exist moving forward. But to answer your question, we have created a digital first panel. At HCODE, we reach, as you mentioned in your introduction, around 30 million uniques on a weekly basis. It was always very important for us not just to have the internal cultural expertise, but to also have access to data on a real-time basis or on a very quick turnaround basis. And so what we've done is recruit panelists from our reach, so tapping into our digital network to re recruit panelists on an ongoing basis 
today our panel size is 5,000 panelists. I'll let Francisco speak to the composition of that panel, but it's been an extremely important resource, not just for us as a company, but also for our brand and agency partners, especially during this pandemic where things have shifted at a very rapid pace. It has allowed us to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening with the community, what kind of issues are important to them. And as you've seen in the case of what Francisco just walked us through, we've been able to consistently poll or survey our audience in terms of how the pandemic specifically is impacting them. Um, I did see a question come through about the data set. We did have uh, 1,300 respondents for this survey, uh, which we have administered now three times since the beginning of the pandemic. So I'll hand it over to Francisco to talk specifically about the panel composition. That's right. Um, the Intelligence Center has been working tirelessly for this last two years to recruit as many um, panelists to our, our proprietary panel. And as May mentioned, we have over 5,000 panelists that have um, complete representation of the Latino community in the United States. What that means is we have panelists from different ages. We know that Latinos um, mostly are younger in, in general, but we also have older generations. We have um, different acculturation levels. We have people that speak are solely English dominant, some that are Spanish dominant, we have bilingual. We've done a really, really good job um, trying to find a, a total representation of the Latin community. Um, and that's what we're, we, we're really um, proud of and where we're trying to ask them as many questions as possible to, tr to understand exactly what this community wants and needs. Great, I, I can see a lot of use cases for this. And let me go over to Matt and get him involved and, and then May can um, weigh in on it as well. Have you been actively using data like this for brands? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually a big part of, of what we do kind of behind all of the services that we offer our brands. We use this panel really to inform our own intelligence and our own knowledge and insights and assumptions as well. Um, but we partner with brands across many different verticals to use this data. And even more so recently, again, specifically when pa uh, the pandemic hit in March, obviously budgets were being withdrawn and we saw a lot of our partners obviously not spending, especially the ones that weren't able to open or even transact. And so we really pivoted and looked at our, our data set that we had with our panel and looked at it as an opportunity to bring out to the market a lot of information that could hopefully inform brands as things progressed. So I think that's been the, the real use case of this with brands is using it against different things that could help them as they message consumers through a time. And that can be things like creative messaging. It can be brand list studies. Um, it can be integrated into pre-strategy uh, surveys where we can try to test the strategies that they might have that they're planning to deploy against different cultures. We can also understand, as Francisco mentioned, the differences across different uh, audiences as well. So one of the things that was really, really compelling during the election was really working with Fairly Partners. We partnered with Biden's campaign with the DNCCC and a few others. And in that case, we were able to look at how Hispanics were responding in different pockets. And obviously after the election now, seeing that they all didn't vote the same way. There were different sort of responses in different voting pockets in different parts of the country, but also based as, as Francisco meant on their acculturation. So having a panel that has that breadth and scope gave us a good idea of some of the signals that ultimately panned out and that you saw come true in the election. So uh, the data set has been incredibly value for us, valuable for us and proven out time and time again to kind of validate the assumptions that we have, but also then at the end of the campaign, validate through performance, whether through brand lift studies or um, favorability, that it actually did work in the strategy and the campaign that was deployed ultimately kind of hit the goals of what it was trying to achieve. Yeah, we are definitely not a monolith. Um, so thanks for, that's part of the great insight that, um, that you guys present, as well as common sense should also present along with H code. Um, <laughs> do you wanna weigh in on this, May? Um, and I think that Matt covered it, but the only thing that I'll add is that, you know, I think the political landscape is definitely a very good example of how this data came in handy with this past election cycle in particular. I think also like examples like the theatrical industry, like it's been obviously hit very hard by the pandemic. And so we have partners across verticals. And in that particular case, 
understanding how behaviors shifted, what platforms were people utilizing to view content online, as Matt mentioned, testing messaging, understanding price point, measuring the impact of the campaign has really allowed us to leverage our data, not just upfront in the strategy, but to be able to rely on this data throughout the customer journey to really be able to track ROI as well as opportunities moving forward that brands and agencies can start to implement as we don't know what's gonna happen in the months to come, but we might be releasing more across TVOD and that sort of thing. So I think that theatrical as well as online shopping, almost every single vertical has examples of how now more than ever, especially when you're talking about a nuanced community like the Latino community, it's important to be able to have data sources that will give you a clear picture of how things are moving and how the community is responding as things are shifting and changing. Yeah, Great, I'm gonna need... go back to, I'm sorry, Matt, I was gonna ask you, are there other sources of data like this? And in the meantime, um, can we work with Maylin in terms of getting some continuity to um, her sound? Yeah, your uh, the headphones going out a little bit for you, May. Um, so in, in terms of other data sources, uh, to my knowledge and to our knowledge of the company, there is no one out there that has a panel that's this large and equally represented across the country and normalized. So I think it's unique in that sense. Obviously, there's many companies that can do panels and surveys and, and pull data out of the market like this. I think what makes us unique is our ability to tap into this not only digitally, and it's a fully digital sort of uh, product, if you will, from end to end, but we can do it in enormous speed. So uh, Francisco always kills me when I say this, but we can turn these around literally in a week where we can concept questions, get them out and get responses back and literally have data and back in the hands of clients within a couple of weeks and, and sometimes less if it's required. So there's, there's a huge opportunity to use this data set to really learn in real time. And I think the pandemic chain, you know, really taught us that things are changing quickly in real time. And so having a data set that allows you to understand those changes in real time is I think a really valuable data set. And I'm not, or we haven't run into anybody that can execute this scale and this speed anywhere else. So I think that makes it unique, but I'm, there are definitely other data sources out there and obviously data sets against this. But again, back to even just our scale, we typically are about, anywhere from two to three times the scale of whatever that would be, even from an overall audience standpoint, from any company that's focused on Hispanics in a digital capacity. That's interesting. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, the slides Francisco shared showed some compelling analysis of trends throughout COVID, which I found fascinating to see how the needle moved from the beginning of COVID to now. But I know that you have data that goes back a couple of years. Um, how have the digital consumption habits of Latinx changed over the last few years? And what does this mean for marketers? I'd like for each of you to briefly answer. And let's start with Francisco since she hasn't spoken in a while. Sure thing. Um, I think, and it, this also ties in a little bit into what we've seen in the pandemic, but it's definitely a trend that it's been happening for a few years. The Hispanic and Latinx community is highly um, connected. We love being sharing um, content, being always connected with our, with our friends. I, myself, um, my family's widespread around the whole basically world. So I'm always connected with them. I'm always calling them, FaceTime, these types of things. And it's vital, especially now with the pandemic that we're all like, we feel a bit further away to be highly connected. I think of a great example that I was playing around with earlier today um, with the Spotify and Apple that are everyone is sharing their their year in review, um, what they've been listening to this whole year. Um, and everyone is excited to show, to see what, they've, what their moods were, were, have been. And, and I just think it's a, it's a great, great example of the connectivity that Hispanics and Latinos have um, that embrace and they enjoy doing so. And I feel marketers should um, make sure they understand this and, and be able to, to, through their campaigns, connect people. At the end of the day, it's about connecting. Maylin? How's my sound now? Is everybody hear me okay? <laughs> Great. Yes. So, I mean, I think that it's definitely no news that Latinos have always been digital first. We over-index and over-indexing across almost every category, and that's only been accelerated during the pandemic. I think that I'll use an anecdotal example for this. Like, 
even looking at my father, he's always been a pretty tech savvy, digital first guy, almost to my embarrassment in the way that he posts everything on social. But I think that one thing I've been surprised to see through this process is that he's now completely buying things online, where before he was using his phone to really do research and ahead of a purchase, but now he's had to, he's been forced to adopt a fully online experience where I'm not so sure that we would have seen that happen before. I mean, there are a number of barriers, especially when you're talking about certain segments of the Latino population, whether that's that they feel like they're gonna be, their identity will be stolen through online purchases. That's kind of a common thing that I've continued to hear is like the fear of going through the full purchase online or having questions and wanting to have someone there to answer them. And now we've seen him go through that entire process. He definitely drove me crazy through the process because he had a ton of questions, but I think that it represents an opportunity for brands to really look at that behavior and fine tune the buyer experience how can we democratize access to products and services where before it largely relied to an in-person experience? And now we have an opportunity to offer products, services, experiences digitally to a community that is much more receptive to it as a result of the pandemic. So I definitely think that while digital trends in the Latino community are nothing new, it's always been a huge opportunity, still largely untapped. I definitely think that there are new ways to connect with the community. There are new ways to provide products and experiences in this space that I think are only gonna to continue to be amplified. Yeah, and I could just jump in. I, it, your dad is not alone. I mean, I, that's one of the things that, we, that you guys found is that 95% of our community is buying online, which is higher than the general population. And trust me, the Tijerinos are doing their part of that 95%. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think the biggest trend for me that I've seen is an accelerated rate. I think May spoke to this, an accelerated rate of adoption. So that's happening at a faster rate than we've ever seen. And it's happening at a much faster rate than even the general population. And that can be because the general population already has plateaued. And now this is getting the Hispanic population, frankly, to get closer to that plateau just as fast with this accelerated adoption. So we all remember, you know, everyone talking about softening the curve, if you will, around the pandemic. This is the opposite effect of this is like a really sharp growth curve that we're seeing of adoption across the board. And, you know, everything that, that Francisco shared, I don't think any of it is that earth shattering. It's all somewhat intuitive and things that you would expect to see. But what is shocking, if you really look in the numbers, is again, that accelerated rate. You're just seeing it grow faster than it otherwise would have. And I think that leads to a huge opportunity for brands to really think about how do they tap into that and really sort of pivot, if you will, for that accelerated adoption to make sure that they're there for the consumers, whether it's a product or service or app, to make sure that they're serving the clients that are now adopting this stuff in a lot faster and frankly, driving more demand for it. Thank you so much. So what would you say are the biggest challenges facing marketers who want to focus on reaching the Latinx audiences and what effect, what effects have the pandemic had on the Latinx consumer market? Um, May and Matt, if you guys could weigh in. May, you want to give it a start? Sure. I mean, I think that it's no secret. I mean, the pandemic has hit our community especially hard, um, both from a financial perspective, as well as higher rates of COVID infection, which is only kind of made worse by the fact that even before the pandemic, we have been higher rates of uninsured or underinsured, lower wages. Like, I think all of those things have only been amplified um, as a result of the pandemic. But I think that, you know, brands have a big opportunity to step in right now. I mean, whether that's in helping to connect the community to resources, um, in empowering people with new ways to use products or services, helping to make their lives a little bit easier. I mean, I think that the sky is the limit in terms of what we can be doing for our community, but we definitely need to be doing much more. While we have seen kind of digital investment there, we haven't seen it kind of on par with the power that we have in numbers. There are 60 million Latinos in the United States, but we don't see kind of investments really matching that or are buying and purchasing power. So I think it's definitely an opportunity for brands to step up in terms of what their offerings are and really being able to directly respond to the need in the community. And, and Matt, before you go, I just wanna also point out that five out of six Latinos can't work from home. We don't have mm -hmm. that option. 
So even right now, as you're dealing with children that are at home, trying to learn at home, you're basically a 21st century latchkey kid that has to pretty much learn on their own. And, and these are other problems that, that have arisen from this pandemic and being disproportionately hit. Um, so Matt, go ahead and, and give us your insights. Yeah, well, I think just back to more of marketers and, and their challenges versus the community and their challenges, I think that may kind of touched on this. One is just a disparity in budget against audience. So, you know, I look back to when I came from uh, Epsilon, I used to look at movie ticket data and that was sort of what I lived and breathed and what I was working on. And we would see a, a disproportionate or higher amount of ticket purchase happening within the Hispanic population, but there was almost no budget that was dedicated to that audience. And so I think that continues to be a problem for multicultural marketers is they're not given the right amount of budget that they can use to, frankly, reach the audience that now represents, in many cases, over a third of the population, right? So in here in LA, it's it's 55% of our population. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big disparity that needs to be solved. But I think that also leads to what the biggest challenge for marketers and anyone who's really just a brand is authenticity. I think that word sums it up really in terms of what their biggest challenge is, is as they move into this space, I think the Hispanic audience is incredibly intelligent around their perception of brand and they can read through what's real and what's not. And I think they can sniff out brands that are just trying to make money and brands that really care. And I think that's going to be the, the power that brands are going to have to capture is that authenticity of them really trying to help these audiences in these communities and how their brands, products and services are going to do that. So I think that's the biggest thing is authenticity. And then again, that's, that's why we use all this data is to make sure when we're building marketing campaigns for brands, we're being as authentic as possible and true to what the audience is going to respond to. That's why this data is so important for brands when they're putting out whether it's branded content or just their creative in general, getting that right authentic message is really, really important. And I think the future of what multicultural marketing will be all about. And I, and I really appreciated the slide that Francisco presented that speaks to the common misconceptions of people have about the Latinx market. Um, it's such an important part of building the right strategies and messages for marketers, as well as anyone trying to reach our community effectively, including the nonprofit world. So how can we combat these misconceptions and communicate more effectively with our burgeoning audience? And again, that becomes more diverse every single day. My kids are Latino Filipino. Um, we are even more nuanced than we were just 20 years ago. Um, so how do we do that? Um, it, Matt, May, and anybody, Francisco, you wanna weigh in? I'm going to give you a good example for that one, and, and Fran can jump, and jump on this because he was part of the strategy, but we, uh, we were working with General Mills, and they were asking us to really, ironically, dive into cereal consumption, and that's one of the things we've seen, by the way, cereal consumption during the pandemic is through the roof, um, but we were working with them to try to understand sort of brand preferences around Lucky Charms and the differences between Hispanic population and general market, and I'll try to make this as quick as possible, but basically what we saw was when you looked at the data, you saw that both audiences said, we love the cereal because of the flavor. The, the taste and flavor of the cereal is great. Now, if any of you have ever had Lucky Charms, it's basically a very bland oat cereal with then some really tasty marshmallow treats that are in there. And what we found was when you then asked them about, hey, do you love the marshmallow treat? We saw the general population saying, yeah, we love them. That's the best part of the cereal. And the Hispanic population was not, it was lower. Even though they said they loved the taste, they had almost no real recall or favorability towards the marshmallows. And we couldn't understand what was going on. And Fran, I'll let you sort of pipe in in terms of your, because you were part of the epiphany of like, well, wait a minute. And I'll let you jump in on that. But that well, was- Well, that's that interesting because just... my kids always pick out the marshmallows and leave me with the bland cereal part. Um, but go ahead, Francisco. <laughs> well, well, what we ultimately saw was the marsh, the, a lot of the Hispanic population, marshmallow is not a thing in Latin America. It's just not something that is part of their culture that they're familiar with. So even the term to many Hispanics in the U.S. is not something they're really familiar with. And I think one level further, the, the marshmallows and Lucky Charms are not our typical marshmallows. So there's two things happening there. But Fran really sort of brought that to our attention when we sort of looked at 
our own people within the company, it was them who raised their hand and said, you know, maybe this is what's going on. And I think that's really a value again to the finding the right partner to use in the space is, you know, not just the data, but finding the people that have, and you know, H code is I think 80% multicultural, having all those people within the company to look at the data and help make sense of it has been incredibly valuable to us and to me specifically. So I don't know, Fran, if you have anything to add on that, but that was really yeah. cool. I think that that campaign was really cool for me to, to work on. Um, Cause for, in my family, I, I grew up in Mexico city and we always had lucky charms. And I personally love the, the old pieces, but my sister always had to, to get all the, the marshmallows in there. And, and I think now there's a product where it's only the marshmallows and you can buy the marshmallows. Um, but what I found really interesting about this, this campaign was how do, how did Hispanics in, in the US actually get to know the brand? And if we compare them to the general population, the general population knew that the, the Lucky Charms brand has been around for a few years. They known it um, from the TV ads that, that happened um, back a few decades. Um, but now for the Latinos, the second generation, third generation, they didn't actually see these TV ads. Um, so they're much more likely to, to their first and preferred Lucky Charms cereal are, be, are the variations. So let's say the chocolate Lucky Charms, the the ones that aren't the traditional one. And, and, and we thought it was really interesting. And it's exactly because of that, because they didn't grow with the first one. They, they actually learned about the brand with these new alternate products. And that just shows highlights the differences between um, the different generations and the different segments. And it's how it's vital for you to, to make actual um, proper research to see what they really like, how they liked it. Why is it, be, is it that they, they like it this way. And, and I think Lucky Charms is a, was a really good example, Matt. So I, I like that you threw that in. So what do you think brands must understand about our community right now in order to reach us more effectively and not commit what I call marketing malpractice that we've seen over the years? Uh, Mei Lin, can you weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to prioritize cultural expertise. I mean, there's a lot of talk about authenticity, but I think authenticity goes even beyond messaging. It's like, how are we being authentic in our messaging, but also in the products that we're offering, in the workforce that people see when they experience your product? I mean, I think that the election, you brought it up, Antonio, I've never heard so much talk about the Latino community not being a monolith, which makes me very excited because as a Latina with a very diverse background, it's like about time that we're finally talking about the lack of diversity that we're seeing that represents the Latino community. So I'd say that what a brand can do is really think about authenticity in many layers, like whether that's in the product offering or in the casting, how can we cast more diverse Latino voices and faces in advertising so that we all feel seen. Um, I think that another important one is probably language, which is Definitely the hottest question that we get constantly. I mean, I think that one of the common misconceptions is definitely checking the box by running Spanish advertising, but, but language can't really be used as a strategy with the Latino community. The cultural relevance of the messaging is much more important. So I'd say that, you know, really giving a front seat to cultural experts, whether that's on your team or with the partners that you're working with is key to making sure that you're being thoughtful at every step of the way um, as it relates to authentically representing the audience. Yeah, and, and I also just wanna to mention too, in that authenticity, I know that part of what we strive at our organization is to make sure that our community is dealt with specifically across other intersectionalities. Like you have to uh, be specific about the Afro-Latino community, the GOBTQ plus community, the indigenous community, the disabled community and make and the Asian Latino community, you wanna make sure that um, those are authentic pieces of it too, not just overall the Latino community. And just a quick shout out to all of the Latinx representation at agencies and at companies and at these brands, the importance of having that representation. And that's really important to me because our loft program, Latinos on Fast Track and our sourcing programs are to provide that talent pool that we hope will reflect us at these companies because those decisions are better made when you have a Francisco or a Mei Lin or a Jonathan and others 
working at these companies. So um, I, I just wanted to take a, a moment of privilege to do that. Um, but based on what you've seen over the last nine months, are advertisers getting it? Are they shifting how they approach marketing to Latinx? Um, everybody can weigh in on that. And, and by the way, what advice would you give to marketers who are just starting out and want to reach the Latinx consumer in a more authentic, nuanced, strategic way? I mean, I think it's kind of a continuation of, of my last thought. It is, I mean, data without a soul is literally just numbers. If you don't have partners or people on your team that can interpret that, not just from a business perspective, but also from a cultural perspective, you're really missing out a big chunk of what needs to be part of the strategy. I'd say that in the last few months, we've definitely seen brands that are making an effort. I mean, one example for me that I have definitely noticed is like Target. Target's Masque platform that is highlighting Latino product, products, brands, and entrepreneurs is a great step in that direction. It's like, it feels good to go to Target now and be able to find certain products that are black and Latino owned on their shelves. They're putting money behind the advertising. They're also putting thought into what types of products and services are in their stores. And so I'd say that that's definitely a good example that I've seen here recently. And yeah, I think that giving Latinos a seat at the table across your organization is going to make a big impact in terms of making sure that your marketing strategies are really keeping this audience in mind. Thanks for bringing up the official uh, partner and presenting sponsor of our Hispanic Heritage Awards, Target. Shout out, Laisha Ward, for getting it right um, and being brought up without any urging from me. Um, Matt, did you want to weigh in on this? And Francisco, what yeah, advice I, would you give a marketer and, and what have you seen as a shift in the last nine months? Well, I, I would simplify what I've seen in the last nine months is a lot of brands and agencies alike have invested a lot of time into, into this. So they've spent a lot of time with us trying to dig in and understand and learn, execute studies in many cases for specific brands. Um, I haven't yet seen the investment side of that. So I think it'll be 2021 will hopefully be the year where all of that time they invested in 2020 to learn and think about what they'll do the funding and the budgets and the markets opening up and you know hopefully the, the the covid sort of resolving itself will open up the opportunity for all of that hard work and time to sort of turn out into investment we've seen great investment in fact we had our best quarter ever in q4 so it, it's definitely there we're seeing the increased investment but i think there was an enormous amount of time and, and talk and discussions around a lot of plans for 2021 that I do hope come to fruition. So I'm very excited about it. I think there has been, again, an enormous amount of time invested in it that I think will pan out in, in a big way for, for both the consumers and for the brands in 2021. And just to add into that, I think, and I'm gonna go with the basics here, brands need to be listening to the Hispanic consumer. Um, findings show that they're screaming out, wanting to, to be heard, um, and they don't feel that they're being listened to 100%. Um, so go to the base is just try and understand what they're saying, try to see what they want. Um, and you're, you're, you're always going to get better by hearing them out. Um, so that's just a simple, simple recommendation, but I think it'll go a long way. Great. And, and I just have to say too, that it, it's really important that as the Latinx community, whether it's for our votes or whether it's for our dollars or our loyalty, that you have to fight for it. You can't be an afterthought and say, this is the better of evils or the, the, the better uh, choice that you can make. No, we want to be um, you know, wooed and, and, and given better options. Um, so I think that's very important. And, and that brings us to the next question. One of your slides spoke to the Latinx community not switching back to an old brand if they sample a new one during COVID. That's very interesting to me because I grew up doing marketing um, and it was always that Latinos were the most, uh, the, the most loyal in terms of brands. And so this kind of surprised me. What can brands take away from this new data that, that really was a surprise to me? I'll jump in here. Um, I think it just demonstrates how the pandemic has shifted. Um, and now it's all, an, it's an open playing, playing field. I mean, even those brands that had that huge, let's say monopoly, it, it doesn't exist anymore. There's, there's a playing field that is opening for, for new opportunities, new alternatives, 
cheaper, better brands, maybe some more expensive as well. But at the end of the day, you can't rest on your laurels. You have to ensure that you're always striving for more, always striving to, to listen and, and market for the Hispanic community. And I, I just think it's, it's a great opportunity for everyone to, to, to take advantage of this epic new um, different period in time that we're, that we're experiencing. Yeah, it brings us back to having to fight for our to, for Latinx consumer and, and not be an afterthought. I'm sorry, go ahead, Matt. Well, I was just going to say it wasn't that long ago that I think these same consumers did have a strong preference for brand loyalty. And I think what's interesting is it's kind of a balance of because of the pandemic, there is this opportunity where I think consumers that otherwise were potentially closed off to new brands are definitely now considering. And I think necessity is opening the door for that. But at the same time, there's a huge opportunity for brands to actually build brand loyalty during this time as well. And I think that speaks back to more of the different examples of how brands can do that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to just jump ahead and just talk about it now. There was a, a, a program that we did with Wells Fargo. Um, they had an initiative around Feeding America and the Food Bank. And we were able to work with them in a way that I think built up brand loyalty for a brand, honestly, that frankly had some challenges that they were going through during the same time. And so we did and used our panel to do a brand favorability study and that proved to be very positive, but we were able to build a campaign with them that really tapped into that authenticity that actually was able to capture that brand authenticity. And I think actually build up brand loyalty as a result. So there was this very interesting opportunity in the same time as brands I think are exposed and there's an opportunity to build new brand loyalty. Um, there's definitely an opportunity to maintain it and enhance it as well with the right kind of messaging and that right authenticity. And I'll put a plug in for organizations like the Hispanic Heritage Foundation and many others that are working on the ground that are great opportunities to, to be able to build that brand in the communities um, in ways like whether it's through a food bank, whether it's through our coding programs where we're teaching 100,000 kids how to code through our Code a Second Language program, there are ways of solidifying that relationship and building your brand in the community as well as on, on the shelves or online. So thank you for bringing that up because those are the creative partnerships that we've had with HCODE uh, to make sure that we're able to provide some substance and gravitas on the ground as well as with the marketing side of things. Yeah, I think people remember emotional times, right? You remember those big moments that impact you in a big way. And that's, I think that's what we're all in right now is this time that's impacting us in a big way. And so brands who can rise to the occasion to help solve, whether it's the anxiety, whether it's stress, whether it's just full pure functionality of providing a product or feature that helps them, um, or even just daycare is the example we talked about with kids earlier on the call. All of that stuff is something that I think will actually really mean something to people as time progresses and continue to resonate from a brand loyalty standpoint for many years to come. So there's really a huge opportunity now to tap into that. Yeah, accessibility to Wi-Fi and computers right now uh, when you have children that are, dis that are disproportionately affected. Um, Latinos were most likely to say they couldn't finish their homework as students, most likely to say that they had a worse grade because of lack of access to Wi-Fi and 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 uh, and a computer at home, and now it's even more critical than ever. So those are real opportunities for brands to to build a connection to the community and demonstrate that they're trying to help the communities get better too and move forward in this time of crisis. So let me ask: um, Francisco mentioned that Latinxes are buying the essentials, but you're also seeing a shift towards items like clothing, electronics, and more products towards comfort and leisure. What do you think this says about the Latinx mindset and can marketers learn from that to help them in the future? Um, and, and, I, and this one's just to Matt because we were talking about this as we were prepping for this. I'm curious about products that my family, for instance, here and in Nicaragua had never used before, like Zoom, where my 90 year old dad suddenly is now using Zoom uh, to talk to my 10 year old daughter. So what, what are these things that we're gonna keep in our lives after adopting them during this crisis? And how does that look for um, some of these marketers in terms of building that loyalty going forward and also having us become uh, used to and, and making these products essential or services essential to us that may not have been before the pandemic? 
Yeah, I, I think the key is going to be brands that can, again, move quickly and can actually respond to what's right in front of them. And, and the Zoom is a perfect example of that. And I'll, I'll go back to something May said at the beginning of the call when she was talking about her father and how, you know, he was adopting all of these things. Well, think about how, how can Zoom um, tie into someone who typically wanted to have, you know, someone in front of them that they can ask questions to. So how can brands incorporate Zoom now into all of their customer service? So instead of having a chat, you can literally just get to someone and have a Zoom with them real quick, get your problem solved and move on, right? That video chat functionality, some brands have already had it, some are looking at it. I think there's a huge opportunity with an audience that's now embracing that functionality across all different demographics to revamp customer service in a way that could be very impactful for brands where it makes sense to do so. So that's just one example, but I mean, even products like Facebook portal, um, anything that supports home office, all of those things to me have a huge opportunity to actually win, take hold and have that accelerated adoption um, where they otherwise potentially would sort of linger and disappear as a many of new products and new features do. There's this huge opportunity to tap into that accelerated growth curve that we're seeing. Great. So as we wrap up this segment, um, let's hit on a topic, which is why this is the right time to try to connect with our audience. You know, with all the uncertainty around the pandemic, uh, should a brand be pulling back or pushing forward uh, with the Latinx community? And let's start with Maylin, and then go to Francisco and then go to Matt, and then we can uh, take some Q&A from the audience. Um, it's definitely not a time to pull back. I think we are all paying attention to who's present, who is in mm. the places where we are all consuming content. I think that digital, we talked early on about digital trends kind of skyrocketing during this time period. Latinos consumption of news content has gone through the roof, how we're consuming social content who we're following, the impact that micro influencers have on this community. I think that it's a time to really not just lean into that, but also testing new tactics across digital. Are you really in all of the places that Latinos are consuming content? There's a huge opportunity to be in front of them consistently. And so I definitely think that it's a time for brands to really lean in and understand where the opportunities lie for their brand in particular and really understand how they can either reintroduce services. I mean, you mentioned the digital divide, Antonio, and I think that as we're seeing technology purchases increase, some of that is obviously because of the needs for education for their children. We're more likely to have school age kids in the household. How can your brand, if you are a technology brand, provide even education on how this can be leveraged to make your life and your child's life easier through this process? And so, it's not just about advertising, but I think we have a real opportunity to educate and empower the community with a lot of the tools and products that they're looking to purchase at this time. I agree, and I, and I think there's a series of emerging technologies and opportunities that marketers can take advantage of. If we think of, let's say, TikTok. Um, at the start of the year, we some people used it, but it was really in the pandemic where it struck and it, it was a huge surge. Everyone started doing videos, everyone was becoming entertained, um, creating content. The Hispanic community loves sharing, loves engaging, loves being unique and creative. And TikTok is a perfect example of how um, they've grabbed all these elements of the Hispanic com um, community and are taking advantage and are connecting everyone. I come back to the point about connectivity with, with what the point that I made earlier about Spotify and sharing. And I think marketers need to be taking advantage of these new technologies um, to continue to connect people. So it's definitely a, a, a time to, to keep investing and pushing forward. It's not a time to step back because people are feeling alone, people are feeling distanced and we need them to be connected. We want them to be connected. And this is the perfect time to do so. Shout out TikTok, another big partner of Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> yeah, no, I would just echo what they said. I definitely think it's it's a time to invest in, in what we're seeing. The the data shows that. And I think the opportunity to learn. And you know, I, I learned this early on my career back in those those OG days at AOL, um, that you know, the power of failure was actually pretty good. We we had a lot of failures early on in the internet. I was selling digital media when there were like four anchor tendencies on the homepage of AOL. 
I launched AOL Latino with Peter Blacker back in the day. So it, you know, it goes way back. And the reality is, I think the, the ability to learn comes with both failure and success. And there's a huge opportunity right now to learn for all brands. So I think whether they win or lose, they need to learn about this audience and be an understanding for the future if they're going to be successful. They really need to start learning now and, and have those wins and loses if it happens in terms of campaigns just to get the experience. So I think brands hopefully will invest more and more in this audience um, and hopefully get those learnings that will continue to see that why that investment is not only worth it, but justified to increase in the future. Great. Thank you so much for all of this work. And I have to tell you that it, it's also um, wonderful to be in a position to partner with an H code with Andy and PRSA, but as well as our partners in the corporate world. I mean, we have a very strong relationship where we have conversations with CVS Pharmacy or AARP um, and Google and all these other companies that also um, want to make sure, and T-Mobile, we want to make sure that we're also there as consultants to them on the identity and on the, on the nuances of the Latino community and how to make a resonant connection. Um, so we're very proud of that. Um, as well as obviously some of the others that you've mentioned, um, like Target and others. So um, here's a question that we just got is, uh, so we're now in the Q&A part. Um, and everyone that is commenting, please, as I said earlier, um, make sure that it's not, I think there's a preset to all panelists for some reason. Make sure it's to everyone because we really want everyone to see. And I've seen all these great comments go flying by and they're just kind of let, put on there towards panelists, but we want everyone to see them. Um, but family is such a central part of Hispanic culture. Is there more data around family and holiday shopping and Latinx passion points? And what impact will COVID have on purchases this season, um, which is gonna be unlike any we've ever had before? Well, I mean, I'll say the obvious, which was just the data we, that's just obviously come in over the last week that we've had in e-commerce. It's, it's obviously, again, accelerated, you know, e-commerce to me had already matured and was a huge business, but yet we still see extreme accelerated growth in that space. Again, reasons for that with stores being closed and, and forcing that necessity, but I don't know that it goes backwards, right? I think that growth continues and you continue to see this accelerated opportunity to tap into that, whether it's through media, through the consumption of content, or just in terms of product sales and tapping into those audiences. Great. Did you want to weigh in on that? I don't see it. I mean, we haven't seen a dip in spending. We have seen a difference in the terms, perhaps, of what people are buying. But yes, families are central to us. We might not be buying gifts this year for our extended family, but immediate family in many cases still remains a priority. I also think that we, we are, we're shopping for deals, we're looking for value. And so now is a time where we can find those items that might be bigger ticket, bigger ticket items at a reduced cost, or we might be getting additional value given whatever promotions are in market at the time. And so our community is definitely looking out for that and actively kind of purchasing those bigger ticket items for their families. And in some cases, it's like smaller gifts for their families as well. But I think that so far what we've seen at least with uh, Cyber Monday and Black Friday, most recently, the numbers aren't showing kind of a drastic decrease in spending. Yeah, and so I wanna to get to the next question. What is the number one way we can make a difference right now in multicultural marketing? Do you um, wanna start with that? Sure. So, I mean, I think that we've kind of covered some of the pieces here, but definitely investment, invest in the community, invest consistently, not just during peak moments, but really understand what those key moments are for the Latino community, what passion points and how are those evolving, and then cultural authenticity and expertise at every step of the way from the team that you're working with, your partners, your messaging, your products. It's only going to pay off in terms of gaining market share. We are an extremely brand loyal community and we are seeing that shift. But once we believe in something, once we believe in a brand, believe in a product, not only are you going to gain a new customer, but you're powerfully gaining an advocate for your brand because word of mouth continues to be huge in our community. All right, let me go to lightning round. Is there data on Latinx use of wellness services and how are they using them? I, I see this all over parks near my house where people are doing yoga, but um, during this time, but 
who wants to answer that very quickly? Is there data um, on Latinx use of wellness services and how are they using them? I'll jump and that, that is one. from Yvette Calder Cardenas. Perfect. We actually, HCode has, um, we've, we've studied this, this theme quite a bit for, in the past few months, just because of the mental and the wellness health impact that the, the pandemic has had. So we do have um, data that we can share afterwards to whoever uh, requests it. And we've mostly seen that Hispanics are um, much more worried about leading a healthy lifestyle than the general population. Um, we believe that it's imperative for them to, to feel safe at all times, to have um, feel safe at home when you're going to work, all these types of things. And having the pandemic looming above us obviously um, stresses out more than, than, they, than in the past. Um, but just to, to answer your question really quickly, we do have that research. We're happy to share it. Um, you can contact anyone here on the H code team and we'll, we'll make sure you get it. I'd love to see that too, actually. Um, we're launching a program called Culture Comforts to deal with mental health and mental wellness. Um, so that would be great. Okay, uh, lightning no, round continues. Just to, just to add to that real quick, Tony, the other thing that's really interesting about that is we've seen again to that point of that theme of accelerated adoption and usage. I think you're seeing the same thing in the mental health space as it relates to therapy. And that's mm. something hey, you called out where we're seeing a lot more adoption within Hispanics where I think typically that was not the case. It was almost somewhat taboo. And I think, May, you can speak more to that, but it, that that's interesting to us in the data is we're seeing, I think, again, necessity is, is forcing people to sort of consider things that they otherwise wouldn't have in a much more accelerated rate than we're seeing. And I think mental health and therapy is no exception. We, we've yes. seen that too. It's, it's an area that I'm personally excited about. I think there's a big opportunity for health, wellness, mental health. I mean, when you think about like mind body, for example, that was largely like a platform where you would like register for in-person classes. How can we make those virtual experiences available and accessible to more, more people? Um, I think that that's definitely an opportunity for growth. And yes, as Matt mentioned, we definitely have seen the adoption of more mental health resources, whether that is in many cases, the children bringing resources to the parents that they may not have sought out prior to the pandemic as a way to cope. So we, the data is definitely showing an increased desire for those types of services. So it represents a huge opportunity for health and wellness brands and products to meet that need. Absolutely. I'm glad to hear you guys have data on that and I'd love to see it because we're doing a lot more in that space. Okay, uh, continuing the lightning round, just gonna ask a couple more. Um, this is from, I think it's Hannah Turnstall. Uh, just a general question, how are you classifying Hispanic investment? You mentioned that brands are investing the time to understand this audience, but aren't putting their budgets there yet. Are you specifically referring to Spanish language advertising? How are you taking into account total market activation that Hispanic insight driven? featuring Hispanic cast, storylines, et cetera, but not in Spanish. Just curious, thanks so much. By the way, that is a great question. Uh, that's the nuance we're looking at too, um, in terms of Latinos like me that are, 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 are less likely to be you know, Spanish dominant at home, but yet have that strong cultural connection. So can you answer that very quickly? May you wanna take that? Um, sure. I think that for us, like just speaking from an age code perspective, we are a digital platform that's focused 100% on the Latino community, whether that's in Spanish, bilingual, or English. Um, and so for us, we're looking at it from the perspective of, of specific budgets that are allocated, not from a, it could be part of a total market strategy, but it's in terms of what we're seeing investment in against platforms like ours that are 100% dedicated to reaching this audience across the full spectrum of Latinos. And I don't, I'm not sure, Matt, if there's anything you would add to that. Well, I, I would just clarify again, for us, when I said investments, it was really media investments. So advertising and media investments that are targeting these audiences um, specifically. And so uh, the concept of you know advertising to general market and assuming that you're capturing this audience as part of general market, which I don't think is untrue in many ways. And this, as more and more of this audience grows and becomes a, a bigger percent of the overall population, I think that's true. The problem with that strategy is you're missing that authenticity. And I think a lot of the brand messaging in general market is not resonating, falls on deaf ears, or just doesn't, in, in many cases, even turns off 
other people that culturally don't have that affinity to it or don't understand the messaging in a way that it was intended. So I think that's the important differentiation is separating that. But in terms of investment, back to the question, um, it was really meant about media investment. And also to be clear, there's been an enormous amount of investment as well. So I meant time and investment, but I feel like there's a lot of people that dedicated time that haven't yet done the investment part that I think will come. But just to be clear, there have been an enormous amount of brands that have fully invested and, and may mentioned a few with Target and others that I think have done a tremendous job of, of really investing in both their marketing dollars, but also into the community in general. Okay, so Victoria Marquez asks, is there any sector product where Latino expenditure is disproportionately higher than other population groups? Um, I would say that for, for us specifically, we, and back to sort of the healthcare side of things, we've seen enormous investment on that side of things because I think with open enrollment, there has just been an opportunity where disproportionately these are the, these audiences in these uh, communities are the ones that are frankly most able to benefit from the products and services that are being offered in that space. So I think that one is potentially disproportionate just because it's aimed there and it really is a, a focused effort on those audiences. Um, but outside of that, I, I don't see it disproportionately in their favor. I think all the other cases is there's a disproportionate amount against general market and there, there's frankly, multiple teams, both within brands and agencies that I think are fighting for more equal representation in budget against what the actual population representation is as well. It, it's, it's the same concept going back to my legacy days at AOL. We were, you know, we, back then it was fighting for the fair share of digital time versus TV time. And you don't hear that argument too much now because a lot of budget has shifted to digital, um, potentially maybe not as much as should from a TV time perspective, but you you don't see the same argument where before you had people spending an enormous amount of time online, but it was still really very small percentage of overall budgets. That's changed. And I think you're going to see the same thing happen with multicultural where it doesn't just become a sub investment. It's a core part of their strategy and their efficiency. And I think the investment part will hopefully pay out next year to prove that out. Great. So we're going to close with the last question which is what is the best resource for people and marketers who want to dive in deeper? What do you, each of you recommend as the best resource for someone that wants to learn more and do more in reaching the Latinx community? Well, I think obviously your organization is a great one to, to tap into and partner with to, I think, learn more. Um, the ANA and AIM are, are great resources and, and partners of ours as well in terms of evangelizing and, and providing an enormous amount of information for brands and consumers to learn. Um, so I think those are great places. And then obviously I'll, I'll plug HCode in terms of everything we've been talking about. Our, our real strategy is to help brands understand this space. And in many cases, we'll invest on behalf of those brands into our own products and services on their behalf to prove that out. So I think we're a great partner to start with as well. But I think in general, just as a starting point, um, you know, signing up and working and joining webinars like this is a great place to start. Yeah, I think the only other one that I would add is, Tony, you mentioned earlier grassroots partners that are already doing a lot of this work. I think that there's a lot that we can all learn from people that are on the ground, interacting with the consumers you're looking to reach and the consumers you're looking to reach themselves. And so I think any opportunity that you have to interact with your potential customers or current customers, as well as grassroots organizations like HHF that are doing this work day in and day out and have a thorough understanding of what the needs of our communities are, are very educational. I learn from them every day. And so I de definitely think that there's a lot that we can gain there. Um, one of my favorite places, sources of information on the Latinx community, a little bit more about the demographics, the population, the economics, um, the contributions that they have to this country. I think they're of vital importance and I like peer research a lot. I think they do really, really good um, in, um, studies and, and are pretty pretty good at, at the job that they do. Um, so whoever needs any stats a little bit more on, on demographics, on population, how many um, they're growing, what the new trends are, um, I would definitely suggest you take a look at their page. Great. 
Thank you so much. And thank everyone for joining us that were in the audiences. And thank you so much for your great questions and thoughts. Um, you have links to the full study that we've posted, but we'll follow up with you after and make sure all of you get it. Please share with anyone you think might be interested uh, as because this is supposed to be a resource for all of us to be more informed and, and, and more effective. Um, as well as we'll send you a link um, to the YouTube recording of this tertulia that you can also share. Thank you, HCODE, for your partnership, guidance, and information. And thank you, HPRA, for your partnership. Stay safe, stay in close touch. Just because we're socially distant doesn't mean we have to be isolated from each other. And our charlas, tertulias, and other programs that we've been doing every single day um, hope to keep us connected, informed, and mobilized as a community. Have a blessed holiday, and we'll talk to you soon.